welcome to Flock Talk, episode 19. Today we're going to be talking about virtual reality games. Should be a good time. So our topic today is going to be virtual reality. But before that, we have some announcements to make. Uh, Berry Game Exchange happened last month, and it was amazing. We got lots of sweet, sweet games. Did we get a lot? No, we got two games, but they're really good. They're really good games. Also, I was at Grand Prix Toronto. Uh, big thanks to Channel Fireball and everyone I met at Grand Prix Toronto. This is you magic wanna... stuff. Why are you talking about it <laughs> if here? If you want to see that magic video, you can head on over to Milo the Gathering and check that out. Also, we got rid of Chris, and now <laughs> we have a, a new co-host. Must see Hobbit permanently. Yeah. What? <laughs> this is news. Surprise, must see Hobbit. You're in for life. Blood in, blood out. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Thanks for being here, Musty. Thanks for asking to have me on. I'm glad to be here. So normally we have a Chris on the podcast, but he's been super busy lately. But uh, we got Musty Hobbit, and uh, it's going to be a good time. Our topic today is virtual reality, but first we got some hot topics to cover. Hot topics. Catherine, there's something I need to tell you. Uh-oh. It's Overwatch's anniversary. Right. thought it was going to be something <laughs> bad. But it was something good. Overwatch is having an anniversary, and they have a whole bunch of different things going on. New skins, obviously. That's par for course. But also, you can play a lot of the uh, events that they've had throughout the years they've been around. Yeah, it's their second anniversary, and the arcade is actually kind of cool, because... Like every day, I think, or or is it weekly that I think it's daily. Yeah, it is. It is daily so far. I know even just in the span of a day, they've shifted it on me once before. Yeah, so I think today we just saw it was like Lucio Ball or something, mm -hmm. and I saw the Maze Snowball Offensive or whatever. Yeah, I and... saw the uh, shooting the robots in King's Landing. <laughs> <laughs> uprising right <laughs> is that uprising and then what was the last one that was just on yeti hunter was a couple days ago oh yeah so it's kind of cool that you can revisit all these although i haven't done any of them we, we try to play the nine wins or whatever to get your loot boxes so then miles exclusively plays deathmatch like the free-for-all deathmatch and now they've added a competitive deathmatch so i can finally prove to everybody <laughs> who is a naysayer that i am in fact a grandmaster I am a grand master. So you did your placements, and where did you end up? Gold. But it's a work in progress, <laughs> and we're going to get there. You know, my head's in the right space now. I'm picking Junkrat exclusively. Things are going well. Have you played any of the eight-player free-for-all with Musty? I did just to get the one loot box that they had attached to getting that. I think if you finished in the top four, you ended up getting a loot box. So I played through that. I really don't play deathmatch on that ever. So Miles would mop the floor with me, I, I anticipate. One thing that's a problem is that you can't sign up for a deathmatch with your friend. Yeah, that's too bad. Yeah, it doesn't let you group and then deathmatch because of collusion. I guess, yeah, collusion would be a thing for sure. Yeah, I I get it, I I suppose, but I mean, <laughs> I suppose you could go into custom game types and things like that, but you don't get the same kind of payout with XP and yeah. all that from, from custom ones. I kind of like that they've opened up all the old event skins for this specifically. Like, there's been some stuff that I, has dropped in loot boxes for me that I missed, like the McCree emote with uh, the three snowballs, where he tosses the snowballs in the air. Like, that's the only one I didn't have for him, and, and it dropped in one of my first loot boxes from this event, which has been kind of nice. And there's still, what, like two weeks left of this one? It goes to, like, June 11th or something like that. Nice. So, yeah, so is it every skin? Like, will we be able to get the those, like, first olympic skins that they didn't open up again or did yeah, it's everything the first Yay. box we opened we got that sherlock holmes mccree yeah of the new ones i was like only one i really want is the mccree sherlock holmes even though i never play mccree because i'm terrible but i was like i need to have the sherlock holmes skin and then that was the one that came in our free gold loot box that has the guaranteed gold item in there the one i really want is the uh symmetra magician she looks like zatanna from dc comics and i think the orissa one too looks really good oh the druid the druid yeah and oh of course doomfist in the tux come on he is stylish <laughs> they've been putting a few characters in tuxes lately um Hanzo's from the previous was really sharp. The rolled up sleeves and the and the vest. Yeah, he looks pretty classy. He looks like a classy assassin. 
<laughs> a classassin? <laughs> I think that's the right word. He's made it up. Is that a portmanteau? Catherine, I've seen you with your 3DS yelling objection constantly. <laughs> What's going on? I don't know. What yell are you objection. objecting to? So I've already played the original Phoenix Wright game, which is the CC Portable Game of the Month for May. Matt Bandy actually had the idea to play. He, I think he posted somewhere that he was just going to play the next game in the series, which is uh, Phoenix Wright Justice for All. And I thought, well, I have that game. I'll play along. And so uh, Matt and I actually just had a little CC Underground version of CC Portable because we were playing along and he was like, how far are you? What did you think of this? What did you think of that chapter? Um, and it was a lot of fun. Like There are actually voice controls on the DS, so you can actually set it, I think, so that you can yell objections. But I never actually did that. I mostly, I didn't even use the stylus. I was mostly using the buttons just because, um, I don't know. Does anyone else have this problem? Holding the stylus actually hurts my finger. Like, Are you gripping like, it too hard? It's just the way that it's shaped and like the little nub that cat, that's the catch to keep it in place. For some reason, when I'm holding, I'm holding it, that piece always spins around and it digs into my finger as I'm playing. I don't know why. I actually sometimes will use the stylus upside down because then I won't have to deal with that stupid little nub that digs into my finger. Maybe I don't know how to hold a pencil. It's a really thin pencil, so it's I understand. It's short. I don't know. I I don't know why I have this problem. These are all first world problems. They are. There's <laughs> And I, they feel like very specific Catherine problems, like... I've never discussed it with anyone else, but it is definitely... Well, now I it's like, out there. I feel like uh, maybe it's just me, but... Uh, so anyway, whenever I play games on the DS, I try to use buttons as much as possible. But yeah, I played Justice for All. Uh, it's a visual novel. I'm assuming that there's a... I don't know if the podcast is out yet. Is Do you know Musty? It's not out yet. I know that the recording also happened this past weekend, so... It'll be out by the time this episode comes out. Potentially. Yeah, it'll be out soon, though, so it'll. I'm lo actually really looking forward to it, because I don't know who the guest is on it, but the discussions that Curtis has, like just those one-on-one -on -one discussions, is a really fun format, and they just like really dig deep into these games, and, and I really enjoy them. Have you ever played <laughs> Phoenix, right, Musty? I have not. Overall, my, my DS experience was quite limited, so I didn't actually get a chance to play this month. I actually just traded in my DSi. I actually no longer have a Nintendo portable after the GBA. I thought you had the 2DS. I, I did have the 2DS, but I think I got that in too close proximity to the Switch. And so yeah. to me, it's like if I'm going to play something on the go, it's probably going to be the Switch. Uh, and I just wasn't getting grabbed by any 3DS title to really dive into. There's no judgment here, Musty. It's okay. <laughs> did you try the legendary Starfy? <laughs> I'm, I don't even know what that is. It's funny because it's like the Switch, it's like I will play that portably with this whole move is kind of like mixed up a lot of my standards to the point it kind of led to the actual conversation that we'll have as part of the, <laughs> the main topic here. But it's like I haven't docked the Switch in months. Um, and when I sit down, it's like I want to play console games. Yeah. So it's like playing a different portable other than the Switch right now is just not high priority. And so I, I used the 2DS to fund some other things and stuff. That's valid. I think like we're almost like the opposite. Like we got the Switch a little bit after release, right? It wasn't right when they released, but we did get it pretty close to the 2DS XL. But I'm a DS person. Like I don't even play it that much, but I like having games for it and I like... You know, I, I'll pull it out every now and then to play, but the Switch we never play. Like, yeah. we we were playing Mario vs. Rabbits. We still never finished it. We rarely played it undocked. Um, maybe part of it is that we don't have Breath of the Wild, and that seems to have been the one that really, like, got people excited about it, Chris especially. And it got him really accustomed to that format, right? Yeah, and I guess, like, because Miles and I were playing Mario and Rabbids together, like, it made sense for us to play it docked on the screen. And we were also recording it for the essentially now defunct YouTube channel. But that's where, you know, it made more sense for us to play it docked. And I played the Octopath Traveler, which is, not, okay, so it's not to say that I don't like the Switch. And I don't like the Switch as a portable device. It's a little bit big for me. Like, I don't know how much I would like traveling with it. I kind of, that's what I sort of like about the 2DS is like, you can just toss it in the bag and, and I, I'm less worried about, you know, protecting it and 
stuff like that. The Switch is just a very expensive portable device, right? So I don't know. I think yeah. I would just worry about it too much. Um, and I don't have a commute or anything. Like I, I feel like I don't, I don't have the ideal uh, situations where it would come in really handy to have them. Objection! We are <laughs> oh, way off topic. Way off topic. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens with us. But anyway, I played Phoenix Wright and it was a lot of fun. I like visual novels. I like the series. I have like maybe three or four others in the series. I have the Professor Layton versus Phoenix Wright and I'm really looking forward to playing it. The thing is, so when I was talking to Matt Bandy about it, just through like Twitter conversations, the game is great and I really like it. But it's long. It's surprisingly long, especially when you think that you're getting close. Like the second one, so Justice for All is only four cases. And when you get to the last case, you're like, yay, I'm almost done. I'm on the last case. And then it just keeps going. It's super, super long. So we kind of both sort of felt the same way when we finished. We're like, I think we'll, we can walk away from this series for a bit. He thinks he could play like one a year. And I would like that only because I don't know if they're making more. So it's kind of nice to like spread out the ones that I have and not like burn through them all and then, you know, feel like I wish there were more. So yeah, I kind of like the idea of spreading them out, but I, I really enjoyed it. And it's a series that if you had a DS, I would recommend, but I'm looking forward to the podcast. Maybe there will be a Switch a switch one someday. Ooh, yeah. Oh, and maybe we'll find out about that at E3 this year. Musty, I know that you do tons of coverage for E3. I gotta, I gotta ask ask you what do you think's coming up man it's hard for me to get into prediction mode in fact this year i actually am taking a different approach to those who aren't familiar with my channel i last week i did a video focusing on like what sony has to do for me to be impressed by their presentation and i'm doing the same kind of thing instead of going here's this laundry list of hopes and dreams like a Mass Effect trilogy remaster, you know, that 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 would be awesome. Things like that. But I'm super excited for E3. Uh, last year we did three big shows at the end of each day, uh, each of the press conference days. So Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. We had a few guests on and, and just kind of recapped everything we saw, which was a blast. But this year we're taking a, a little bit of a different approach. Uh, we are going to do individual recap shows for each press conference instead. Um, so... EA starts on Saturday um, with theirs, which I assume will be very Anthem heavy. And I'm really looking forward to hearing about what they have uh, for Anthem because BioWare's pushing all the chips onto the table and fingers crossed that they nail this game because I can't see another big developer get like swallowed up by the monstrosity that is ea and it's in and its way of handling these companies that they've acquired right so i, I really want to see anthem succeed what else am i looking forward to i know that bethesda's got something up their sleeves at this point i can't think that rage 2 is the only big reveal that they have this year i just don't know what it is there's this talk of this game called starfield which they talked about three or five years ago which is supposed to be like the third pillar in the fallout elder scrolls and then a space type of game um like open world it's like open open space world <laughs> i think so Isn't that like anthem and no man's yeah. sky <laughs> that's quite possible i mean and i'm sure we'll hear more about the that no man's sky patch as well that's coming in june um why even bother at this it's point? the actual multiplayer right that they but they're actually making the game that they said that they were going to make at this point or they're getting closer ah uh, i don't know the game's like ten dollars in the bin <laughs> maybe just let it go it's a great time to get in i'm sure that that patch will be free <laughs> for those who have it already, but at least the Xbox version uh, will have that patch on the disc, as I understand. But there's just an abundance of stuff. It's funny because last year, the first half of the year was so loaded with games. And the beginning of this year, you know, you've had a couple really big titles. You've had Monster Hunter World, you've had God of War, you've had Sea of Thieves release. Yeah. The back half of this year is going to be insane, and this E3 is going to kind of set the stage for all of that. Um, what What's still coming this year? There's a rumor that, that e, uh, Smash is going to be in September and kind of accompany the online for the Switch. September also has Shadow of the Tomb Raider, mm. and uh, what else is coming in September? Oh, Spider-Man? The Amazing Spider-Man <laughs> comes out, yep. The Amazing Spider-Man comes out. <laughs> October, though, is insane right now. You're getting both Call of Duty and Battlefield. You're getting Red Dead. That's in the span of three weeks. You get those three games. Wow. 
And so everyone else is kind of trying to move out. Deep down, I'm hoping Halo 6 gets the kind of release that Bethesda did with Fallout, where they announce it at E3 and it comes out that fall. Uh, you know, so a very short window, because they don't need to draw that out. They can release that game fairly close to whenever they reveal it. The problem is I'm hearing, you know, that Halo 5's multiplayer is so successful right now that they would almost be breaking their player base by saying, hey, here's Halo 6, and then all of a sudden you kill the momentum on that. You don't want to split the party. <laughs> nope, definitely it's not. It's like if they came up with Overwatch 2, I would be super upset. Or a Destiny 3. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Imagine if they announced Destiny 3. People would go <laughs> nuts. <laughs> well, I think there's at, least, there's at least one more expansion plan for Destiny 2. And this last one I it was kind of lukewarm in reception, although I, I'm not... I'm not tapped into the Destiny community. I hear about it from other podcasts and things like that. But I played through it. I liked it. Um, I haven't booted that up in, in, in quite a while. I'm, I'm kind of hoping, again, that my sort of multiplayer campaign-based game is Anthem. I don't want to put everything behind that game, but I really hope that it's a return to form for Bioware because, like I said, they need it. That one is um, Xbox exclusive? No. Oh, it's not. That one's both. They showed it on the Xbox stage. Um, so I think much like other titles, right, you kind of associate one. Yeah. That's the other interesting thing about E3 is that, is that mar marketing deals tend to make people think a game kind of belongs to one system over the other, even though they're, you know, the big question now is is not, is it on both PS4 or Xbox? Is is it coming to Switch? Is it coming <laughs> to Switch? And so every, everyone wants everything on Switch. I feel like there's just some things that, don't work on a switch and they would never be at least our preferred way to play most games right like that was kind of the nice thing i think about like the wii and the wii u is just that those games were just wii wii u games and it made sense that they were exclusive and then if there were games that you know that were cross-platform i would pick the playstation because we're playstation people you would probably pick xbox right i'm actually a little bit closer to the middle at this point just one of us one of us <laughs> hey, I mean, it's funny how things have gone over the past year, right? Like, I, I, I went from, from no PlayStation at all uh, to Pro and now PSVR, and I get it. I understand, and there's there's so much good. Like, I've picked up more PS4 games in the past three months than I have Xbox games, partially because Xbox has Game Pass, mm -hmm. so there's not really a need to pick up. So you already have access to their 10 games. Hey, my. Hey, this guy. Ah! But you bring up a good point. PSVR is something that all of us are getting into, and we might as well just move on over to our main topic, PlayStation VR and virtual reality. This is Player One of the Cartridge Club, and I wanted to take a second to tell you about Bonus Barrel. BB is made up of developers, artists, and testers from within the gaming world, and they bring their knowledge and insight to every show. Topics ranging from gaming culture to development cycles, you don't want to miss what these insiders have to say. Every Wednesday, you can get your fill of Rob, Seiji, Lef, and Shelby wherever you listen to podcasts. So the year was 1992, and I went with my mom to the Canadian National Exhibition, the CNE, if you will. And they had all sorts of different things going on at the CNE. There was a Super Mario Brothers tournament, which I definitely played in and then there was a, the thing that i was really drawn to about the cne this that year was the virtual reality it was always something that i was interested in i saw the lawnmower man and i was like <laughs> i want this to be me i want to be able to live the lawnmower man life and uh experience what it's like to to just be in virtual reality and so i lined up and we lined up for hours to get into this machine. And it was like a little circular area that you had to stand in. And they put all these cables all over you. And uh, they put this giant helmet on. And my little neck could barely hold it. <laughs> it almost snapped under the pressure. And I remember getting into this virtual world. And I was so excited. I was so excited. I was like, what is this going to be like? Am I just going to live my life now in this virtual world? And it was like a triangle and there was a circle there, and I just got to kind of move around it, and that was the game. Since then, I said, Chui! to virtual reality. Virtual reality is nowhere near as good as I needed it to be in 1992. 
But luckily, there have been some improvements in the technology since then. Slight improvements. Slight improvements. Did you have any experiences with early, early virtual reality? I can't even think of it. I don't think so. Virtual boys? Anyone virtual boys? <laughs> Not me. No virtual boy for me, no. <laughs> no. But yeah, I, I understand that you were a skeptic, Musty, of virtual reality. I mean, so th the only really exposure that I've had to VR up until recently was like Navy Pier in Chicago used to have, it wasn't really an arcade, but it was kind of a VR experience setup. And so that you would go in and it, it was like some racing game where you were on Mars or something, but I never went. I had a friend who would go and it kind of acted like laser tag. I think, you know, you got your nice little printout at the end to see your stats and you'd Maybe not laser tech, maybe more like Mech Warrior or something like that um, okay. <laughs> back in the like early 90s. So up to this point, and even last year at E3, I was bored by the concept of VR. And I was just like, oh, this, this isn't for me. I don't get it. It seems like a gimmick or just a fad. And earlier this, well, maybe a month or two ago, I, I, I started to think about it. And I was, I was looking at some of the stuff. I, mean, I watched a couple of reviews of some games and saw there were some people really kind of touting how well this system performs. Some uh, individuals from the club, Julian in particular, he had gotten the PSVR at, at launch. He had nothing but great things to say. And I, I think I had talked with It's Rocket Sauce as well, who had played some uh, Resident Evil on that and said that it was the real deal. And so, again, I kind of took all that with a grain of salt. And then they recently had dropped the price on the system. And that took that price down from 450 US down to 350 US. And it started to put it a, a, be a little bit more realistic. My, my, my curiosity was starting to peak on it because of some things that I was seeing. And then they had this massively good trade-in deal. And I brought a bunch of stuff to GameStop, of all places, and they gave me a decent amount of credit to where this gamble was not overly financially committing. I picked up the PlayStation VR. I got the Skyrim bundle with the Move controllers, the headset, the camera, and then there were two discs. One of them was a demo disc, which you can just download the demo disc. And then one of them was Skyrim, um, which is, you know, full-featured $60 game. I was like, if I don't like it, the money that I'm actually forking over, I can more than recover that if if I end up not liking the system. The difficult thing, and I think one of the challenges that Sony is having right now, or maybe it's just something that they haven't figured out a way to get this out into the market, but I, I feel like they need more demo stations. They need people to be able to get their hands yeah. on this so that they can understand. Because when I got it set up and I got into the headset and I, I actually tried, it was the Spider-Man Homecoming demo was the moment when I was like, oh, I get this. Like, this makes sense to me now. Like, it felt right. It's crazy to me that you bought it without even trying it at all, ever, and and having, like, no other real experience with VR. Like, Miles and I had tried it two years ago at Fan Expo in, in Toronto, and it was... It was actually in 2015. Okay. That was the first time we tried Two and a half years ago. I'm sorry. <laughs> and we, uh, we played Kitchen. Or well, played you kitchen. played Kitchen. I actually didn't try it, but Miles tried it. But I was watching, so it was one of the games I wanted to ask you about, which was The Heist. Because when everyone was demoing it, and it was really popular, like, there was a lineup for it. You had to sign up online for that one, right? And also, you couldn't choose which one that you tried out. You just had to go to whichever one was available. So, like, some people got stuck with just, like, the soccer one. If you were standing from the outside, you could. they had the screens of what everyone was playing. And the heist, to me, looked like the most fun one. Kitchen is just too scary. And actually, Kitchen was the only one they, that you weren't allowed to see. That was the one that was under lock, right? Like, I mean, we later find out that that was Resident Evil 7. Yeah. Before... Oh, gotcha. Okay, I, I, I wasn't putting two and two together. Like, I wasn't familiar with Kitchen as a term. So that makes sense to me now. Yeah, like, because I was like, can I see what he's seeing? So they didn't have it on the display above. They wouldn't even let me go and look at the screen that he was looking at. But the guy was really nice and he let us sneak in a tiny little bit of footage before before we got busted. So it's crazy to me that you bought it without even trying it because and just like you're saying, just trying it is enough to really start kind of putting the seed in your mind that there's something to it for sure. I brought this up. I, I did a video for the first time. I, I did a video on my impressions, my early impressions on PSVR. You should check it out. It's actually the most watched video on my channel ever, which is crazy. We should mention your channel here, though, because I don't think we did when we introduced you, but it's Second Breakfast. And we'll put a link. We do links. So we'll put a link Sweet. somewhere. What's better than first breakfast, huh? Second, second <laughs> breakfast. <laughs> 
Yeah, so your first impressions? I go through all my first impressions in that, but I actually got my wife to try the headset on, and she doesn't game that often. She likes Dr. Mario, and that's probably, you know, <laughs> the, the extent of a lot of what she likes. I put her into that Spider-Man Homecoming demo, and she had the same kind of reaction that I did, where she's like, you know, all of a sudden, like, she's, you know, really getting into firing the webs, and, like, <laughs> she's moving around and dodging, and I was just like, I didn't have to coach her to do this. Like, it came naturally to her to react in that way and so there's a moment there where you kind of zip up to this crane that's like 400 feet above the street level okay and my body freaked out and that feeling even though i was totally safe i think that feeling and that little rush of adrenaline from that little bit of fear because i don't like heights i feel like that flipped some of those switches for me and said yeah this is a good deal and, and there have been some other games that i have since played i only talked about a couple things in that video because i tried skyrim and i did that without changing any of the settings and the locomotion on that. One of the big challenges with, with VR, I think, is the movement in a 3D game. Right. So a lot of games uh, do this teleporting thing where you kind of point at the ground where you want to go and you zip over there. It's like it's like if you ever played Myst. It, it's, it's yeah. kind of like that where they have these pre-designated spots where you can stand. In these games, it's not so much that there are pre-designated spots, but you kind of just kind of go, okay, I'm there now. Now I'm here. Now I'm here. Yeah. You kind of bounce around. And I, that's what I was doing with Skyrim. And, and a lot of the replies that I got on that video where you're doing that wrong go in and tweak the settings um and since then played a couple hours now of skyrim in the headset which i'm afraid that that's going to commit me to like 80 hours in the headset which is going to be <laughs> skyrim is the full game it's the full game which is crazy yes. because most of the vr games that out there that you can buy are like one hour to four hours like right. the experience is like max four hours like doom vfr which is one of the games mm -hmm. by the way we just got a vr for the playstation as well <laughs> Well, we got PSVR. Yeah, like the timing of this worked out really well. And also, I'm just going to quickly say the barrier to entry was totally the price, right? And mm -hmm. so the reason why yeah. we jumped was because there was a really good bundle deal at a really decent price. So it was the Doom bundle with the camera, no motion controllers because we had the PS3 ones and you looked it up for us and said, yes, we yep. can use the PS3 motion controllers, which is awesome because we don't use those at all. And then three other games with it. So sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, but... no, we got Rick and Morty total recall impatient and rigs the doom vfr was the first real game that i tried out on it and one of the things that i noticed first of all it's only four hours so it's like a very brief version of the doom from 2016 it's like a side story almost yeah kind of i popped that in in preparation for this i mean maybe about 45 minutes in so far Actually, I'm about 45 minutes in as well. I actually really like the movement. I didn't think I was going to like it, but the addition of strafing on top of mm -hmm. being able to teleport wherever you want to go, I think if you learn how to use them both, it takes a little while to get used to, but when you start using them both together, your movement actually becomes freer than it would be running around. Like, the lack of jump and the lack of actually being able to walk, you're not limited. The movement actually feels pretty good, and I was wondering yeah. if Skyrim was the same way. So Skyrim can be either of those things the, on the move controllers there's those there's the big move button yeah. um if you press that one where whichever direction you're facing you will walk straight in that direction so you can set it so that your forward button is that button and then basically you move the move controller a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right and you'll kind of trend one way or the other oh. so if you want to set it that way you can if you want to do the teleportation one, you can do that as well. Uh, the thing that I've heard about Skyrim is that Skyrim, especially if you're going to play it the whole way through, you're probably better served to just play with the DualShock. Oh, okay. The thing that you lose is the individual hand controls. So, like, the thing that I really like about Skyrim, and, and there's a couple other games that have embraced the bow and arrow mechanics really well. Because you're at, you actually, you know, you with one hand, you're holding the bow, and the other hand, you're actually knocking the arrow, and you're pulling the arrow back, and you're kind of, <laughs> and it actually gets all of that aligned, and you let go, and it hitting your target on the first shot feels super <laughs> fulfilling. Like, it's like, yes, like, you got that right, and then you just keep going. You just keep pulling the arrow back and letting it rip. For Skyrim, like, I normally am a sword and board, or maybe a great sword player, and this time through, I'm leaning more toward bow and, like, destruction magic. Magic. You can really easily switch between them. So I can do the bow from a distance. And as they come up to me, I just switch to, you know, fire magic and just torch them with my hands, uh, which is really cool. 
think I watched a video that was just like being a magic caster in Skyrim VR is like the most fun because you see your hands, right? That's the one thing you have like mm-hmm. these little floating hands, right? So that the actual magic casting is like really a really fun mechanic because it feels like the magic is coming out of your hands and stuff. And also the bow and arrow would feel pretty good because we played on PlayStation Move for PS3, the PlayStation Sports. Sports Champions? Yeah, Sports Champions. Or something, yeah. And uh, the bow and arrow, we used those batons as well, and it was amazing. So they had already nailed that mechanic without VR using the batons. So it's cool to hear that it's just as good in Skyrim. Now, you know what? One game... I'm going to say that I was not a huge fan of. I I might need to give it a little bit more time, but it's the Rick and Morty Total Recall. I'm not a huge fan of that one. Catherine, you tried it as well, right? <laughs> I think part of the problem is that we had just set up the PlayStation VR, and I don't know if we did it all. Like, everything's hooked up properly, but I think maybe there's a calibration thing in that game. I think you need a big 360 area of space because you need to stand sometimes. Sometimes you need to sit down. I think that you should always be standing. So when you start off, you're just looking at a TV and it's on a, it's on like a little TV stand and there's like a DVD player and you have to pull a DVD and, and put it in that starts the demo and that starts the game essentially. But there's a cupboard in, underneath the TV and it feels too low. So then the way our setup is, we had to sit on the couch just to get to the stuff at the bottom. It could just be a space issue in our apartment. Like the couch kind of gets in our way. So if we need to mm-hmm. get low, we actually have to sit. Whereas if we didn't have the couch right behind us, I think you could just crouch and it would work better, maybe. At one point, there was something in the game that I had to pick up, but the couch was in the way. And so my hand would essentially need to be through the couch in order to reach a thing in the game. Yeah. And I was like, ah. So that is, is very much. much our issue with our couch placement. You know what? I can go to the CNE and see if they'll <laughs> give me that giant circular thing that I had to stand in in 1992. <laughs> Maybe we just need a bigger place, but I think No, also... <laughs> no, no. The CNE. <laughs> but I, I also think, like, I want to kind of, like, fiddle around with the camera placement and the way that it's picking up the move controllers. I don't know if it's necessarily better on top of our TV, because you can also set the camera below it, and I don't don't know if that's better or worse depending on like the angles of our apartment and where we are so i think there's a lot of tweaking that needs to be done the other big problem between miles and i is that he's like a foot taller than i am it's will probably either be You'd too to, low like, for him or too high for me time. so it's not ideal so but i mean he likes vr more than i do like i don't normally get motion sickness in like cars or anything like that but for some reason video games can make me a little bit dizzy so he was playing rick and morty i'm like i have to leave the room now because it's just a little bit too nutty for me. Like, it was spinning around too much. I think that Rick and Morty could be fun if we could get past, like, the first thing you have to do. Like, the intro was funny. It felt like Rick and Morty. And if, like, I think it's good if you like Rick and Morty, which we do. If you don't like Rick and Morty, you're probably not going to like VR <laughs> Rick and Morty. But Th- There's another game that I really want to talk about. And it was one of the first games that came out for PlayStation VR. It's called Until Dawn Rush of Blood. And it is a roller coaster gallery shooter. And it's in the Until Dawn world and it's like a horror game. So when you're in the roller coaster, that solves one problem with VR, which is movement. (laughs) So you Mm -hmm. can just, you just move along with the roller coaster. Gallery shooters, I think, work really, really well in VR. Yeah, they do. It's a lot of fun. We went over to Pam and Will's place, Pam from Cannot Be Tamed, Media Mavens. Will insisted that I play Until Dawn, Rush of Blood. Um, We were invited over specifically so that Will could make you play this game and laugh at you. I'm pretty (laughs) sure that's the only reason why we were invited over. He was so I was excited. Like, I don't want to play this. It looks scary. And then the was like, no, no, you got to play it. Here's the element. <laughs> and so I was playing it. I was scared at first, but the more I got into it, the more I was really enjoying myself. Catherine stepped out when we got VR and Rush of Blood was a PS Plus game one month. <clears throat> so we had it downloaded on the system. I was like, you know what? I tried that game at Ben Will's Place. It's going to be just as fun. So I put on the gear and I started playing and it started getting really scary. And I was by myself. So then what I did was I took off the VR helmet and I just rested it atop my head while I looked at the TV. So I was playing the game through the TV, but I had to move my head around still because the VR helmet was on top of my head. 
like a VR hat. To be able to look around. <laughs> to oh be able God. to look around, and I was just shooting on my TV. <laughs> my aim was way off, but it was a lot less scary. Well, yeah, there's uh, there's something about having that screen inches from your eyes that I had a similar experience, and I said to myself, I was like, just put the, just put it back on, you'll be fine. Um, it was on the VR World's disc, there is the, the shark attack oh, cool. experience. Oh. There's three stages to it. There's only one of them where the shark shows up, and it's very clear that this is the one where the shark shows up. I already don't like it. It's really unsettling, and for me, it's like, you know, there's some people who are scared of space because of the expanse and the nothingness. I think there are a lot of people, more people, who are more afraid of the water because of how claustrophobic it is, and so you're inside a dive cage they're taking you down to uh what they assume is a ship that has capsized and so you go down and a large great white shark that decides to come by uh and check out your cage now while all of this happened like as you get down you can kind of feel you there's some uneasiness to it and i i had exactly that kind of feeling where it's like let me just take the headset off for a second and kind of reset myself yeah and then i was like okay let's get back into this because your body buys into it. And that's what I think is so crazy about how far this has come is that some of these games do such a realistic portrayal of real life that it feels terrifying. Now, what ended up happening, my cat brushed against my leg oh my God. while this no, happened. No, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, oh, good. yeah. Like, I, I think I think at that moment, the shark was was circling. Oh my uh, god! It may yeah. have even been behind me, and the cat brushed and against you're my like, leg. Oh, it's and just I, a catfish. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I panicked for a second there, and and then again, I was like, it's your cat. You're at home. You're at home. Like you, you, you kind of have to center yourself again. That one's a good thing for somebody who's like, I don't understand VR. I because there's nothing to do. You just basically are in this thing. There's no. You don't have buttons to press. You don't even have to hold a controller. You can just turn around and look around, and then. You get to see what their reaction is when the shark proceeds to try to open the cage like a can opener. And that's especially scary, because if you die in VR, you die in real life. <laughs> is, <laughs> is there music over it, or is it just the sound of being underwater, like which is no sound at all? That one, uh, there, there, there is music on that. Immersion is, is an interesting thing, because like you can dial some of these things up and down. Like in Skyrim, a couple things you should do for Skyrim to get the best experience are to make your HUD in entirely transparent okay turn the music off and no subtitles and then basically all you hear when you're walking through the forest is this 3d audio of birds chirping in the distance and stuff like that it's too immersive is there such a thing maybe it's super easy to get lost you could basically find a high peak and just sit down and just just be like i like this place and be totally content there you know and then you have the other places where you know you're in the middle of a hellscape or uh you know a <laughs> Mars Mars base or something like that or one of the things that I would recommend if you are a recent PSVR acquisition is to go pick up the first Battlefront disc you're going to find it super cheap uh, included on that is a VR X-Wing mission and it's maybe 15 minutes totally worth the three or four dollars that you're going to pay for that disc uh, but you are flying in an X-Wing and it is incredible we just installed it we should also have our fan blowing on us so it feels like we can feel the yeah. wind in our hair yeah, it was like... crazy we did this thing we talked about it on the podcast a few months ago but we did this thing called the void and what they do is they put in a headset on you and they give you like a gun but you actually walk around in yeah. an environment we were in the Ghostbusters and it one. was the Ghostbuster one what they do is they tell you to get outside of the building so that you're like walking along the edge it's of a scaffolding that, yeah. outside of a building and you're walking on the scaffolding and wind hits you really hard as soon as you get out there so you actually feel like you're yeah. outside it's a 4d That's experience cool. right because we also got we were with a and we, i mean it's the same the same technology that's on your head right so imagine that mm -hmm. But the wind is hitting you in the face. <laughs> My friend and you're wouldn't walking go out. On sca or scaffolding. She was so freaked out. She's like, I'm not going out there. I can't do it. And then, like, we were like, oh, it's not so bad. And the thing is, though, it was scaffolding and it was rickety. And so yeah. it actually also shook and stuff. And then when the wind picked up, it would really rattle and she just couldn't do it. And then eventually she was just like, we were like, okay, well, like maybe it'll let us, it'll lead us back in and we'll meet up again. And then finally she was just like, this is stupid. It's, it's not real. And then she just, she finally walked out, but it was like enough to be like, nope, I'm not, I would never do that in yeah. real life. Why would I do it now? And you have to remind yourself, you're nothing's good. Yeah. Nothing bad is going to happen. You're literally just walking. You're just taking a step. What it does to your brain. I would 
like to read about the neuroscience of how VR affects you and how it works and how it manipulates you. I'm sure there will be a ton of it over the next couple of years. I feel like it's almost at that point where it's gaining enough steam. I mean, you could use this for, for plenty of treatment methods, all kinds of stuff. It's a way to approach situations that uh, you wouldn't put yourself in normally, but you can go at your own pace. It's not like you, you hate heights, right? So yeah. people go, oh, go stand off the edge of the Grand Canyon and that'll fix it. It's like, no, there's other ways to do it. And, and this is a safe way to do it where you can take away the actual peril that you would be in and just be able to experience it. Getting back to games itself, like w one of the cool things is, is the number of like experiences that you're getting. Like the Batman Arkham VR one, I, I definitely want to give that a try at some point. There's the Final Fantasy one. Which Catherine played. The fishing one. Oh, did you? How is it? It's super, super fun because it's like, it's monster fishing. It's not just fish. It's like big, crazy, giant monster fish. Um, now, Catherine might be a little biased because she loves fishing in all I games. love fishing and I also like fishing in real life. So I think I just really like fishing. But that one was pretty fun. They let you play the whole demo for it. We played it last year at Pan Expo. I, I think it just uses the, the DualShock controllers. Or does it use, use the, the baton? It must have used the motion controllers i just don't remember it's a lot of fun and i've never even played final fantasy 15 but if you were freaked <laughs> out about the shark there's some jump scares in the final fantasy fishing game i'm really really wimpy so like it didn't take much to like freak me out and then also like there's a part where um i didn't realize but it switched from the fishing rod to a crossbow and i didn't know and so i was still just trying to fish this big scary thing and, I, and then i could barely hear because i had the headphones in but i could barely hear the guy who was running the demo going shoot it and he's like just shoot it like oh i now have a crossbow and then i was able to like kill the fish that way or like i think you kind of harpoon it or something it's fun is it out yet i'm pretty Pretty sure it is. I I haven't actually looked into that. It's digital only. Oh, okay. Okay. It's fine with me. Is it standalone or do you have to have 15? It's standalone, I think. It is standalone? Okay, that's good because I only have 15 on Xbox, which is totally uh. weird. <laughs> I'm surprised they haven't gone and, and made like a peripheral yet, like a rod and reel type of... I would 100% not... get one. Like the Dreamcast was the last system that had one like that. Well, I mean, they're not Nintendo. Like when the Wii came out, there was a <laughs> peripheral for everything. Oh, that's right. There was a Frisbee. Well, there was like the Cooking Mama ones was like literally just a spoon, but... <laughs> like, or the babysitting mama, which was a baby. Yeah, we have that baby. Oh, that's right. We don't have the baby. Oh, we don't have the baby. We have the game. I was going to bring up the aim controller, which is one of the things that I have yet to pick up, but everyone who has played games that support that controller stands by that as being a way to amp up that immersion to a whole nother level and the controller looks kind of goofy right it's the it's the evolution of your those plastic guns that you used to get for the wii right like yeah. the big orange shotguns and stuff <laughs> like that this one is it's a very modern playstation look that you know the all white and it's got the the orb on the end that for one of the move controllers on on that uh there's a game in particular called farpoint which everyone tells me don't play Farpoint until you have that aim controller because your perspective will be entirely different. Was Farpoint a full price game? It was bundled with that controller oh. for $80. Okay. The controller itself, though, was probably closer to 60 of that $80. But, like, Doom supports that controller, uh, and, and there will be no shortage. There's a game uh, coming out called Evasion, I think. They just announced it like last week that is a class-based gallery shooter, a multiplayer gallery shooter um, that uses the aim controller as well. And I'm sure we're going to find out a lot more at E3 coming up. I hope so. Yeah, and, and that controller looks really funny. It's like a weird shape and everything, but I have a feeling that when you're holding it, it's meant to feel like you're holding like a like an assault rifle or something, right? Yep. So It's supposed to be one-to-one -one feeling. Like, it's supposed to be spot on. The move controllers, they do a good representation of whatever you have in your hands or, or your hands itself. But when you have then that, you know that you've got two anchor points, right? You've got them. Yeah. You're holding it here and you're holding it here. And and so they can then make sure that that representation in-game is always exactly at the right angle that you have the gun. 
It'll be interesting to see if they could get some non-gun applications that use that aim controller. I, I just can't yeah. think of what that would be at this point. But one of the things that I, I kind of hope that they make a peripheral for, uh, they have the Zen Pinball oh. in VR. So you, you can actually play the pinball in VR. It would be cool if they had like a brick that has the flipper the flipper buttons on the side. I mean, it would also work with the batons though, right? Like you can put them on either side and press the buttons. Yeah. That's true. One of the games uh, that we had listed here that we haven't talked about yet is is actually different than everything else we've talked about up to this point because it's in third person, and that's Moss, uh, which was announced at E3 last year. As I said, you as the player are watching the environment. Yeah, we played the demo. It's a very different feeling of like, you know, that's like puzzle platformer, but not... It's such a strange perspective, right? You feel almost like a god in this world, right? Like the way that you're looking down on it, it's only because you're controlling a tiny little mouse, right? So you're looking down on it. And I remember like, even just to get on its level, you really have to like sink low because he's all way down on the ground and he's really tiny i think it's a girl actually it's fun and the and the puzzling is really fun the combat is really interesting too you kind of control the mouse but you're mostly just making pathways and you're clearing a way for the mouse to progress its way through the levels at least the one that we played the demo or you're we played. putting it on a platform and then moving the platform yourself it's a different kind of virtual reality game because it's not your perspective and you're not the player you're con- you're still I controlling mean, it's character. still your perspective but you're a watcher yeah, you're a watcher. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's cool to see people take different chances with VR. Like, I don't want to just play first-person games. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, I would like to just maybe enjoy the depth also, a little like, differently, like, in a puzzle plot. Moss is also beautiful, and, like, the VR is a little bit different. Because from the demo that we played, all the action happens in front of you. But if you look around yourself, like, you are in a forest, can turn around and you can see, and it's gorgeous. It's absolutely beautiful. So I do want to get the full game and play through that one. So uh, one of the things that was talked about as soon as PSVR launched was, like, are we going to be able to watch Netflix on this? Are we going to be able to watch YouTube? Play games that aren't VR compatible? And the answer to all of these things is yes. The reason why I enjoy VR as much as I do was that I could still, like, watch YouTube. If I'm watching something that Catherine wouldn't like, she can watch Friday Night Lights on the TV, <laughs> and I can watch a Magic the Gathering YouTube videos or James Acaster's stand up or even play overwatch i played overwatch with the vr helmet on and it was pretty good like the screen was a little too close to my face like my field of vision was it was too big it is like a giant screen in front of you yeah and you and and you can tinker with that too so there's there's three different settings for depth um so you can the biggest one i think they equated it to like a 224 inch screen whoa so like imax size screen which i i love that i played I, uh, Axiom Verge like that last night. Absolutely incredible. All the distractions are gone. It's like me in this game. Let's go. And it's also a huge cost saver because I was going to buy a 224 inch TV. And uh, <laughs> Catherine was saying that, you know, maybe we'll get VR first. I don't work. even think our wall is 200 <laughs> inches or whatever. Mm-hmm. But but yeah, it's like playing on a movie theater screen. I was actually watching the James Acaster stand up and uh, there was a shot from the audience looking at James Acaster and I, I could see the silhouettes of the heads in front of me i was like i'm in the comedy club right now watching a comedian (laughs) this is amazing and i think that they could actually probably do live shows like broadway and stuff like that you could watch it on vr and it would look great yeah there there are some apps that sony has that kind of have some of those vr catered experiences there's one in particular that like can plug you into like NFL, NBA, stuff like that. So places where they've taken a 3D camera. Oh, okay. Most of it's like a 180 camera. So if you turned around, you kind of, you don't get a whole lot. The one thing I wish for Netflix, not, and I'm not sure if Netflix does this, but I think Hulu does, which doesn't apply to you yeah. in Canada, but... Um, I think Hulu actually makes it seem like you're sitting in a room. I've I've seen one where it looks like you're in a movie theater. So like when you're a a thing once, Catherine, where where we went to a VR building and we watched documentaries in VR and that's when it would look like a movie theater. If you turn to your left, there were like there was just like an empty movie theater seat. Like so it looked like you were sitting in a movie theater. 
and there was like popcorn and stuff on the <laughs> on the floor um <laughs> and then you were looking forward at you and and it was like you're in the movie theater yeah i i kind of wish cinema mode was like that i i kind of wish cinema mode for watching 2d content was like that that it gave you some ambiance other than just darkness it's great for focusing on what you have but sometimes if you could like say today i want to be watching this on a screen on a beach or something and like you could change the environment around yeah. you while watching that i think that would that, that would be a really cool thing um very interesting thing that i just that well i didn't discover but i found out because i've heard people talking about it you can plug in any hdmi input and watch it through cinema mode oh Interesting. I plugged in my Xbox into the... You, you plug it into the breakout box okay. for PSVR. It still has to be connected to the PlayStation. The PlayStation still has to be on, but you can trick it into believing this is this is all 2D content, um, and, and, and it works. One thing that I'll say about the VR helmet is that I wish it had a fan installed, maybe right on the forehead, like a fan, just <laughs> cool off. Because it does get a little warm in there. And one virtual reality experience was a movie that we saw, not a video game, but it was kind of interesting. It was about this couple who were getting into a fight, and the they said it was so much easier being the other person. And then what happens is that they switch bodies. So you start off as a, as a man, and you can look down and see your body, and then you switch bodies with the person you're arguing with, and you're all of a sudden a woman. And you look down at your body and, and you get like a different perspective completely. So I thought that that was a pretty interesting thing and something that you can't really do in other mediums. One more thing I wanted to bring up. I'm hoping this becomes a trend with Sony, but Sony added a patch for Wipeout Omega Collection. It is masterful. How incredibly perfect that game is in VR. If you are sensitive at all to motion sickness, that game is going to make you sick. <laughs> we'll just okay. preface that. And there's some things you can do to kind of dial it back. Some of the things they do is they cut a lot of the peripheral down to make the screen more in front of you to kind of help try to reduce that at all. But that game plays at its best when you you have your full peripheral. You can, you know, you're locked to what the driver's head would be, not what the car is. So you can like, I was like turning into the turns <laughs> and kind of seeing where I was going. And it's like, I, this is crazy. Like it, it is, I really hope that Sony finds other applications for existing titles and starts to patch in stuff like this. I feel like that's something that would go a long way other than games that are designed right. for it. Like, you know, Resident Evil 7 was, wasn't designed for VR, but it is a great implementation of VR, as I understand. But this was spot on, and I hope there's more. Cool. We will definitely try that one. Yeah, I mean, there's already so many games that we still need to try for PSVR. But let us know. Either tweet at us or let us know in the comments if you're watching this on YouTube. If you played something in VR that you really enjoyed and you think that we should check out. Or you can go to the forums. Or you can even go to the forums at cartridgeclub.org. And if the forums aren't good enough, you can come and talk to us at Cartridge Club Chicago. That's right. We're going into odds and ends. Odds and ends. Cartridge Club Chicago <laughs> is happening very soon. End of July. Musty, are you going to be there? Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. <laughs> good. I'm kind of helping coordinate the whole thing, so I, I better be there. And Catherine, you're going to be there too, right? Um, I'm thinking about it. Uh, I, I booked our flights. So we are, we we're, are locked it's, in. we're locked in. We're actually going to Chicago for the whole week because we've never been and I'm super looking forward to it. It's been one of those places that I've just always wanted to go to and it's our it's going to be our first time. So we're going to spend the first half of it just doing all the touristy stuff that and then probably other be people will be doing. a banquet hall where a bunch of people record po a bunch of people from the club are recording podcasts live. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm nervous about that, but I know I'm just nervous about Duke. Like, because Duke's going to be there, he's going to see us, and he's going to judge us. I feel like so Duke judgy. will judge I feel like Duke will probably judge us. No, he's going to be so supportive. <laughs> Everyone is so supportive. Yeah, I'm just really looking forward. It sounds like there's going to be a lot of people going, and um, it'll be super fun to hang out with the ones that we've already met before. We've only met Musty once, and I can't wait to go see him again in person. Um, And... Travis... Travis. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be exciting. It's going to be um, a lot of fun. Hopefully we'll go on an Al Capone tour. I haven't brought that up yet. Oh, but, yeah, uh, you guys have a great time. You should. Uh, my, my wife did that. We go to Chicago a couple times a year, usually, on average. Uh, she did the Mobsters tour, and she said it was an absolute blast. 
Okay. I'll find the link for you. Okay, nice. fine. I'll I'll go then. Nice. Um, we like doing stuff like that, though. I'm really looking forward to uh, the Art Institute. Yeah, I'm how, excited. How about you, Catherine? Have you anything anything to say in odds and ends? I don't think I do. No, no. all right. I don't think so. Musty, our yeah. guest host for today. I know that this was an inopportune time to have you on the show because you're dealing with something right now. Well, I mean, I'm dealing with the same stuff that Chris is dealing with right now with the move. So, oh, that's uh, interesting that you still found the time. That's... <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you made time for us now. Uh... We, love, we love you, Chris. <laughs> As of this re- releasing, I will be days away from closing on my new home. So uh, I'm super excited to get access to that. Not a, it timed out perfectly. Internet's going in day one. And of uh, we actually don't physically move to the house for two additional weeks beyond that. It's just through VR? It's just a VR house, yeah. They just unlock the content for us when we go to the bank. I guess that's how that works. Uh, Effectively, I have two weeks to get things kind of set before we actually have to live in it. Uh, And then we have two more weeks after we move to get everything truly out and cleaned and ready for the new owners of our current place. So my whole setup is going to be changing quite a bit, but The thing that I like about it is it's a dedicated room. I love this place. It has been nothing but great to me. There were a lot of times where I kept shuffling the setup because nothing was, you know, bolted into the walls. And I'm finally going to bolt some stuff into the walls, bolt some stuff into the walls. Like have an actual (laughs) like real uh, bookshelves that I'm making as opposed to target solutions uh, that I've that are assembled and that kind of thing. All of that's coming pretty soon. And uh, some of that, I think, means that there will either be an abundance of new channel content or there's going to be a little bit of a lull on the channel. So I'm, I'm not quite sure yet. If people want to make sure not to miss the content that you're going to be coming out with, they can always go on, subscribe, hit that notification bell, and really help out Musty and the Second Breakfast. And also you're taking over the CC Prime now, too, so for the Game of the Month. Yeah, this is true. I'm going to have to figure out some balancing here, I think, when it comes to the stuff that I'm doing. <laughs> and your YouTube channel just hit a milestone, too. 300 subs. Yeah, man, congrats. That's so awesome. When do you think the Halo episode where you and Ryan, it's Rocket Sauce, have taken over the... The only other person to be a guest on our <laughs> show. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we got that recorded a couple days ago that I am hoping that we can release that relatively soon. It'd be nice to get that out prior to E3. Yeah, so Ryan and I have this episode. The bros are back for June, uh, and then Ryan and I are going to be hosting July's uh, episode, which is Street Fighter 2. Let's pick your subtitle. And then... uh, August, Ryan and I are going to be hosting again, uh, but the guests will be the bros. Oh, awesome. It'll be interesting to kind of flip that on its head a little bit. And then you'll want to check out the Halo episode because that's where we make the announcement of what September's game is. Yes, we're definitely looking forward to that because, yeah, the schedule's only up until August, so we'll find out what's next. Leisure Suit Larry, I knew it. Oh, I'm a pro. I'm so good at that game. <laughs> so I just want to say thank you to Musty for being on the show, guesting. I know it was a last-minute thing, and you, you really stepped up. Thanks a lot, man. Hey, th- again, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. You seem it. like the right person, because as soon as we posted the picture of VR, within minutes, there was a message from Musty going, here's all the things that you should get for it, and here's all the games you should try. And, this, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I was pretty sure Musty was going to chime in, because you've been like... You actually super... called it before he even messaged us. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I, oh, did I, you? I said, I'm going to post this picture, and then we're going to hear from Musty. And it's it's great, though, because we are we don't know. like We kind of just dove headfirst in, just like you did, um, without a ton of uh, knowledge about what's out there even, so just besides the demos that we played. So thank you for all your advice on games to get. It seems like everyone kind of needs a mentor when it comes to (laughs) getting introduced to vr and so yeah hopefully uh, i can introduce you guys and then you can spread the good word of how crazy awesome vr is and and whether you go playstation or or otherwise we didn't even talk about pc stuff yeah maybe chris will do a podcast just on the pc ones (laughs) we'll make him buy one we'll make him buy something (laughs) but uh for musty and Catherine, i'm miles thank you all so much for listening take care everybody bye